Right. Good morning, everyone. Um, oh, one second, Paul. I'm just going to do my introduction for you. Sorry. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. It is a great pleasure to see how many have joined us here today. And welcome to this webinar hosted today by the Future Water Association. The speaker is Paul Horton, Chief Executive Officer at the Future Water Association. Paul has, uh, has more than 25 years experience with NGOs, charities and trade organisations across the water and environment sector, including TV, radio and policy work. Previously Director of Membership and Development at the Charter Institute of Water and Environmental Management, Director International at British Water Policy Advisor at the CBI. Other roles have included Steering Group Member of the Government Chief Scientist Fund, Global Water Security Report, Council Member, Society of Environment, Member of Engineering Council International Advisory Panel, uh, Member, UK Water Sector Advisory Group, Management Committee and Council Member, European Water Association Council Member, European Network and Environmental Professionals and DWA Representative on Climate and Water Strategy Steering Group for the Water Framework Directive, um, CWEM Representative to the UNFCCC meetings. We do encourage you to ask plenty of questions at any point during this webinar. Please do type your questions into the Q&A box you'll find at the bottom of the screen. At the end of the presentation, we will present your questions and answer as many as possible. It is an absolute pleasure to have Paul with us today, and I would like to warmly welcome him now to take control and begin the session. Brilliant. Thank you, Martin. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I love the introduction. I should get a recording of it from you just to reflect back on all the things I've been doing over the years. Um, all things I've enjoyed and all things linked to all around the water sector, which is a major passion of mine. Um, so today I'm going to talk about what visualising a virtual network actually means and what it means in a context of a water sector and a sector that if I look at the UK, and you think of pipe networks, sewers and drains, a sector that's been evolving for a couple of hundred years with what's underneath our feet and underground. So Future Water Association, just very briefly, we're a sector wide body bringing together everybody from the utilities through to the innovators. Um, we're about 150 companies and we get involved in all the discussions around innovation, inspiring the, the next generation, uh, what to do in terms of making, making business better, how we connect, bring people together, and what that means when we bring people together, and all the things linked to regulation and skills, and obviously the, the future, what we think about the future from now, and how we want the future to look going forward. So very vibrant, um, exciting organisation. Um, happy to talk to anyone about ourselves. Please connect with me. You'll see my details at the end of the presentation. So let's just have a think about what's happening. We, we, there's a drive towards transformation of the water sector. We've, we've produced a couple of reports ourselves as an organisation. And actually, what, what does that drive mean? It's not just around innovation, because innovation has to have a space, um, a, a way to be adopted um, fast or even fail fast. So there's all the things about the landscape of the sector, uh, what, what opportunities sit there. And if you think of the last 15 to 18 months, that really has thrown up an opportunity to reimagine how the sector looks, uh, what's the art of the possible, where do we think things like innovation sit? What are, can we do with new ideas? And, and how do we bring all these things together? I think they, they are core to what's happening in terms of transformation. And that sits alongside all the things around climate change, population, aging infrastructure, all, all the classic areas that, that we have to think about. And in terms of today, I'm really gonna focus around how we think about the networks and what we can do now. So you have everything on this diagram from the classic, the, the pipes in the ground, excavation, you know, all the, all the things that we understand, road closures, permits for that, through to what the academics are doing in terms of uh, developing 3D um, 
models looking at different parameters so you can visualize uh, pipe networks across a whole city landscape uh, pipe bots many of you will have probably heard of, of the work that's been developed out of places like Sheffield University under under 2065 in terms of pipe bots how they look at a network how they start to move towards the self-healing world and of course the what we might call the Google world where you hold your phone over a over a road and immediately can see all the different pipes, be they water, be they um, uh, gas, etc. Um, and wouldn't that be an amazing place for us to get to? And how far are we away from that? And if we think of the UK itself, what are we talking about? So we're looking at something in the region of 340 to 350,000, possibly even slightly more kilometers of water mains which is which is huge i'm not going to do the to the moon and back scenario but it's a huge amount built on a continuously add-on basis we didn't start from scratch to put all these in the ground cities and places developed so you start with a network and then you keep adding to it so it's it's not been the perfect way that this has all happened um, it, it's probably been a functional way if i'm thinking of it in in, in a context but alongside that, you're looking at around about 620 to 640,000 kilometers of sewers and drains. And, and several years ago, the, the regulations meant private, uh, private sewers were adopted, which, which added a huge amount of kilometers of network to what the water companies themselves had to manage. So this is this is where it gets really significant because you're looking at things of a different age, different materials, um, and, and understanding where all that infrastructure is, is itself a massive challenge. So what have we been trying to do as, as Future Water? Well, we've done a number of things. So um, this reflects a workshop we did uh, a few years ago. Um, back in 2019 and what we set out to do was to say actually we can't just keep talking about things like reducing leakage we can't keep having the regulators say here's your next target um, there needs to be a different way that we think about this so a number of us gathered together it's about 25 organizations that we sat in a room you, you know um, teas coffees and all the rest of it and said we're not coming out of this room till we think of something different we got a graphic artist there and who said i will sit at the back and draw and then she did an amazing job and we said we have it's not just about rethinking it's about what we can do now with what we know that starts to create the difference so we came up with several game changers as part of that whole process and game changers looked at things such as how do we explore ideas in a different way how do we reflect the information that we already understand in a different way and actually if we look at what could make a real difference then we're talking about the virtual world and what we said in this in this session was that it doesn't need to be the virtual world where we've got the perfect picture previous slide google phone we can see everything it's actually the world where we can start to talk about the information that we already know. And why would that be different? Because it would allow us to talk about technologies, ideas, it would create safe space to have these discussions. We'd actually be able to share things before we even reach the stage of having to do a pilot. So we would almost have a virtual testing facility in 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 this in in the network and how how would this therefore start to fit together so we would act as the hub or there would be a hub called virtual networks that would bring the supplier groups together the water companies it aquia and for those who don't know aquia that's the uk water industry research body um, universities the emerging center of excellence i'll touch more on that um, a little bit later and and the regulators and why will we do this because it starts to bring together what we call in the whole ecosystem not everybody's reflected there and this is an evolving process but it brings the key parts of the sector together 
and and things like leakage which I've, I've referenced because of the complexity of managing leakage and the different practices etc there are lots of islands of excellence that are dotted around and those islands of excellence are where we need to pull in the knowledge and the insight and things around best practice in order to then share this amongst the group so the overarching ethos therefore is how is is to gather knowledge inside best practice as i mentioned across water and wastewater networks um we need to focus we believe on everything and this for this to work practically it operates within a non-competitive uh, environment or framework and because it's then for the benefit of the whole sector the companies the supply chain as i mentioned and show their customers and the environment and it's all about the continuous improvement and development of knowledge and the information brought to the network is challenged and evaluated so it becomes a process where you can easily pull in the evidence you can synthesize it disseminate it and then people can look at what that information is and start to apply what works well and you can challenge things so the continuous evaluation and improvement process reflected here means that you can apply it across different topics that could be technologies um, practices and things that are within a non-competitive environment process and the whole focus is about sharing knowledge and about understanding and that starts to create the benefits to the sector water companies within this context themselves can influence what that practice starts to look like sharing their challenges directly with all the suppliers so the suppliers get a better idea of what the utilities are facing and how they are using different types of, of technology and of course within all of this circular process you begin to see where the gaps are and the gaps as i referenced a couple of slides ago leads not just to a gap analysis but actually points towards where future developments might be focused. So you start to bring in the innovation side of things of what can actually happen. And why would this be fascinating for the sector as a whole? Well, you think of it in terms of leakage. Imagine there being less leakage, um, you need to abstract less, pump less, etc. You start to get to a process that's beneficial in terms of the environment in terms of carbon reduction, in terms of resilience. And the past 18 months has probably shown us that the need for resilience to be a major factor within what we're thinking about. So looking at this in another way, how might this look? The virtual networks platform, as I mentioned before, is the safe space. It's the safe space where everybody comes together and I'm including all the academic community alongside this. It's not just utilities and suppliers. And indeed, it's people who are working in other sectors. And this is where it becomes really important. And this is where it becomes really key. And the shared goal is to identify how things work better, how we go through a continuous improvement process and therefore begin to engage on a range of ideas. Another mantra for, for this process and this approach is no geographical boundaries. Because of the nature of how the network and platform will function, it brings people together across the sector. So if you think of a UK context where we have Anglia Water, Thames Water, Seven Trend, et cetera, et cetera, and you have people working directly to those organisations, you take away those boundaries and you focus around the subject area leakage being an example in water mains um, CSOs combined sewer overflows if you think of wastewater systems um, drainage and wastewater management plans being developed etc it brings together the focus right across the whole of the sector and again as as I've mentioned before what, what starts to emerge through this group is the pragmatic insight as well as the forward look towards innovation so you can start to bring 
all of these different elements together and it and it's not about producing I should, I should make this clear it's not about producing academic type reports um it's about creating a virtual environment where we remove the bias so we don't have oh we tried this 10 years ago and it didn't work approach we actually say what's happening now and can things work now even if we tried them before so it represents that opportunity to start to be different open to all um, to spot some of the potentials and maybe throughout the co the conclusions as well but we're not aiming to be opinionated or biased it's an evaluation process so if you if you look at this one of the challenges that as operates and happens across the sector if you think of it from a utility viewpoint is as i've mentioned there silos and there could be silos in terms of new and existing technologies in terms of best practice etc so if you're a water company one of the challenges that you have is that things are often trialed not just with yourselves but with other water companies and there are often results emerging that are different and they could be different for all, a number of reasons that doesn't mean that the technology isn't applicable but it does point towards the rising challenge of conflicting results which is a potential barrier to the development of technology and how we look at it so within this context the sharing of information means that so technology may have a set of results that suggest technology doesn't work in this environment. You know, you can think of things like hydrophones, but actually it doesn't work with one water company, it works with another. You start to look at the information that emerges from that to tell you where the differences are. So you don't start from a basis that all oh, hydrophones don't work. You, you start from a different basis where you're sharing the data and you're looking at what's happening in this environment. And you start to remove, remove what is in effect, not just a challenging process, but it's an expensive one. From the supplier's viewpoint, six trials or more makes very little sense, no matter what size of a supplier that you are. So it's the common goal approach. And if you start to move down this route, as a reference here on this slide, you start to share not just the data, but you start to get the supplier information being brought to the table. And if you, if you think of uh, loggers that are used in terms of leak detection, as one example, there are suppliers that have information uh, uh, in relation to all the water companies. Let's bring this thing into the table, which at the moment isn't shared. And we can start to develop things that are not just trusted, not just repeatable and not just creating a benchmark but you start to change the nature of performance and you change the nature of performance in an open environment so to give you one example you may be aware of the public interest commitment that's been taken on board by the water companies and it relates to um, trebling the rate of leakage reduction for example, by 2030, and the journey to net carbon zero by 2030. When, you, when you're talking about this time period, uh, which is not long, um, you know, eight and a half years now, um, time is critical. So you can't afford to have trials for every bit of technology, particularly if things have been trialed before. So the nature of bringing all this information through to the network not only saves time, but it acts as a potential driver to those new ideas so it can lead to much better decision making and it can help drive the development of products and services on a sector-wide basis which we think is really interesting and fascinating and in practice you you might come up with something like this 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 is a mock-up model by the way as opposed to what we've what, what we've yet to finalize but it gives you a very good idea of how it might look so bringing the information together if you looked at what a leakage reduction toolkit might might encompass you have the interventions what might those interventions be and and what you then start to look at how they relate to an impact 
So what would the impact be in terms of the effect? What, how, how would this work in practice? Uh, where would you apply these? How would you do it? What are the costs, etc.? Probably, you know, standard standard things that you can think about. And these types of toolkits are used in several areas. For example, when when we were looking at the background for this, we found that the police forces use these in terms of their interventions and impacts. And so it starts that starts to bring in a focus from a different sector. So you could quickly, as you build this up, have information, not just at your fingertips to, to, to quote the phrase, but it allows you to access information quickly. And if we are gonna create the maximum amount of change in terms of leakage across our network, what is it we need to look at? So obviously there are other areas you, you can add into this, you know, information about your, uh, about the networks, about the age, the pipes, the, you know, the, all the classic infrastructure things but it gives an example of what can be done and it starts to then feed into in advance of any regulatory review and business planning process what that might be in terms of the economic cost and that itself is is hugely important and you can apply this approach for across different areas you know we, we just use leakage as, as an example it's the furthest thinking we've, we've done within the network but you can apply this to um, blockages in wastewater networks as I mentioned earlier to you know combine sewer systems and, and storm overflow scenarios it, the network itself is is agnostic and it's focused on achievements outcomes best practice etc so it it also means that opinion is reflected but not opinion that creates a bias but opinion that can be backed up by knowledge so i i probably would use the phrase open-minded approach rather than opinion and it starts to mean that the boundaries break down because you're talking about the subject areas and you can bring in outside sector uh, information as well potentially potentially within this scenario technologies themselves can start to evolve at a at a pace and it can also lead to as being more agile because we there aren't the silos in place it starts to encourage not just that agility in terms of what can happen but it starts to create um, a diversity of thinking and a diversity that starts to say right we can have different solutions here what about this this could be creative this could be interesting um, and we've not tried this before or actually we tried this 10 years ago and this went, what do you think there can be a very very fast response rate with this and there's also the scalability making this work and operate practically you have the potential to do things on a rapid basis but you have the potential for uptake of ideas solutions technologies best practice to be rolled out very quickly across the whole of the sector as opposed to just on a company com by company basis and as i mentioned before the, the the pragmatism here is that things will operate in a pre-competitive or what i would probably call a non-competitive um, environment and the sharing of the information would be open and that's that's our approach open by default we recognize the challenges with existing uh, contracts ndas and other things which absolutely fine but we will talking about avoiding the pitfalls and understanding the value of the best practice product services and it's important i think to recognize that there's a lot of technology out there and a lot of ideas but it's not necessarily clear how all of this technology and these ideas can can be applied to, to the challenges that have been faced at the moment so this is where this group starts to make some real inroads and difference so to to restate some of the things i've mentioned already it's it's about understanding and best practice but it's about a platform in a non-competitive environment that brings everyone together and doesn't matter what size you are in terms of a supplier or indeed at the at the utility level there's a commitment to a shared goal. And actually we're talking about how we engage 
without fear or ridicule, without being worried that we're going to be overshadowed, talked over. And actually, we will start to pull on the network and the success of the network and link it to the emerging center of excellence, which is currently uh, undergoing development with by the water companies. Um, so it's going to make a difference because of how we look at things, how we choose technologies and how we potentially challenge existing thinking. So rapid utilization of different skills, diversity of people are the critical elements here and in terms of how this will function. We're not, the, 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 this whole approach is, is so much about engagement and collaboration that it's not meant to duplicate what organizations like the Center of Excellence would do. It's not sitting there to be a product endorsement vehicle or bias and opinionated, as I mentioned earlier. It's there to talk about the best things that are out there or the things that we need to think about or information that maybe hasn't been shared on a wide scale. And we're not seeking to be a we know all group. It's about a genuinely virtual approach to looking at pipes and sewers um, and how we do things differently. What's the frontiers of our thinking? And again, just to just to re-emphasize the network of, of the experience of people, open-mindedness, forward thinking, um, open to all. You, you can see open by default is a is a tagline that that we use and very much the recognition that practices technologies etc are evolving and they're evolving at a much faster rate now many of the utilities themselves are becoming uh, data processing companies with the amount of information they're beginning to collect how do you start to apply that information in a safe place that helps to drive forward thinking And, and what will success look like? Well, on, on the right hand side, if, if you haven't looked at it yet, I would ask you or suggest that you go to the Water Innovation Strategy UK 2050 and have a look at the challenges and ambitions set out in that document. It's, it's pulled together thinking of the utilities and being shared with and consulted on with the whole of the supply chain, including academia, et cetera. It's a, it's, it's a good read. But, so the focus has to be across the sector, engagement of, I've put water companies a supply chain, but obviously by supply chain, I'm including the academic research community. Uh, cross sector, I think it's vital to bring in some of the thinking that's taking place in, for example, um, what the likes of National Grid are doing, what Network Rail and others are doing, et cetera. The drivers, we, we all know about the classic drivers um, in terms of aging infrastructure and population, but there's drivers to do things differently and apply thinking. And I would argue that within all of this, there's a drive to get access to and encourage the next generation, not just in terms of what they can do, but in terms of getting them involved in our sector. And it needs to be a whole ecosystem approach. There's a diagram there trying to reflect all the different elements of the sector. Well, that's, that's great, but the ecosystem approach is vital. And this is where the network can function on a very uh, practical basis. And, and can this work? Um, yes, it can work. There's, there's already a great example where in terms of um, metering, um, in terms of testing the meters and what it means in terms of insta in installation that several water companies came together to work with the suppliers under a testing to install uh, framework and process and that showed really good results where if there'd been trials that all of those companies individually would have taken a lot longer to achieve would have um, meant that the the manufacturers themselves would have spent a lot more money etc so there is all there are already examples where this this approach and this process is not just worthwhile but it's actually essential for how the sector moves forward and what are we going to do our next steps are to take one example from the leakage reduction toolkit that i showed earlier um, we'll be looking at acoustic logging 
as as a workshop and as a workshop that that tests all of the things that i've outlined to demonstrate how the network functions what it can deliver and actually put where some of the gaps may be that we need to think about to start evolving the network it's not a perfect scenario at this point in time but it is a lot of great ideas that we've pulled together the discussion across the industry uh, a couple of sessions we've already done attended by hundreds of people and said this is the way to go and this is what we need to start to deliver and within all of this you're talking about information that we have now we may not share it very well but we actually have a lot of that data and a lot of that information sitting there at this point in time so if we start to put that into this public domain format we can start to talk about things and understand our networks now without the necessary the necessary need to head towards the Google phone approach that I showed earlier. We can start to do a lot with what we already know. And that becomes very interesting when we start to look at the existing data that, that we have. And for example, we, we have already a, a, across the sector mains failure database. So we have understanding of pipe networks, ages, materials. Now we need to overlay that with our understanding of how the networks themselves are operating across the different regions and start to share that information. And this is often where you see differences emerging in terms of technologies that have been applied, um, in part linked to the hydraulics of a network, but in part linked to how networks are looked at and understood, and even do we know where everything is. And that in itself is an evolving picture. So alongside this as our next step in the workshop, we're taking the findings to the Networks November, we're calling it. We've, we've evolved some of our events and we're now looking at having a whole month, which we use as a, as a focus point, not, not as a be all and end all, a focus point that says, when we think about these in the right way, we think about innovation and research, the drive for carbon, um, energy from sewers, etc. What does all this mean in terms of the virtual network that I've just outlined? And what information can we start to pull out from this session and start to apply it and use it within the virtual network? So we're calling it Networks November and we're looking at huge numbers of, of different data points during that whole month. Uh, we're looking at water efficiency, for example, and the amount of data that's emerged as people moved away from the city centre back to their homes for, for 15 months or so, what that's telling us. We're looking at the latest thinking in terms of innovation and research. And we're also doing a little bit of what I call a tomorrow's world view. For those who don't know tomorrow's world, it, it, it was a programme run by the BBC where they looked at future developments. And it was always interesting to go back to see what of those future developments had actually happened. So we, we're using that idea to look at some of the clever stuff that's been emerging in the past several years and actually what's happened to that clever stuff. So that that's we think is, is a really important part of this whole process. So a lot of information there and I appreciate you listening to me for, for the best part of half an hour or so and if you want to get in touch with me directly well there, there's the association's um, web link but there's my email as well and um, I'll be very happy for anyone to to contact me yeah either via the email if you're on LinkedIn I'm on LinkedIn so please um, Send me send me a request and I'll um, I'll connect with you, Martin. Well, you. many thank you for that, sir. That was absolutely fantastic. I've got some questions, so I'm going to dive straight in. Um, first question: um, Do we need to have a perfect visual visual visualization of the underground networks to make this approach a success? It's um it's the word I always struggle with, Martin. <laughs> yeah. Um, no and, and what what's emerging from the work that we're doing across this network is the information we've got now is hugely valuable are, are we valuing it properly and do we understand the value of the information we've currently got 
I would say that that we don't. But by the time we get to the world where we, as, as I showed earlier, we can walk around with a Google phone and, and see see the networks um, immediately and have a perfect underground picture, things will have moved on quite a lot. So there's there's enough information out there now that we can start to share that will give us a, a good realistic picture of what is underground and more importantly, how it's actually functioning. Thank you very much. Um, another question. Um, do you apply a qualifying accreditation protocol to your membership? Oh, that's, <laughs> that was a question I, I, I wasn't expecting. We, we, we are there as an organisation. Our whole focus is about connecting the sector um, okay. at, a, at our heart. And, and, in, and we want to try to... We use a wonderful phrase about unleashing the power of the supply chain. So I, I know of, I know we've um, we, we've adapted something for those who know one of the very old films, Unleash Unleash the Kraken. Um, we, but there's huge potential out there, and I I bump into people via our our own Dragons Den program, Water Dragons, who have got some fantastic ideas. Um, and more recently, uh, a bunch of school kids who who were just brilliant, and and, and they're thirteen years old. So, but so what does that mean? We're, we're f focuses on innovation, uh, forward thinking, and how we do things differently as a sector. So, if you're involved in the water sector, you're already supplying into the sector, or you're a brand new innovator. Knock knock on our door because we're we're interested in talking to you, in terms of being part of Future Water Association. With um, with the future generation coming coming upwards and forwards in the water sector, because we're coming to a time where we're losing this generation, is it a worry about who's going to be working in the water sector? Yes, it is. I think I think there's several things that, as a sector, we just need to get a grip on. So. One is that a lot of people are going to retire within the next um, six or seven years. Um, that it's difficult to get a handle on the exact nature of that figure, but estimates suggest it's around about 50% at the moment, mm -hmm. possibly slightly higher. And, and I'm including the, the supply chain within that. You've got a lot of knowledge there of people who have been in the sector for a long time and how do we capture that knowledge? Um, that knowledge includes experience, includes the things that, that, that people have themselves learned, but also includes who they know, which is very important. You've got the next generation coming through, and are we blending them well with the generation that will retire in a few years? And then I'm, I'm not sure we are. So a generation that maybe knows new technology, new, knows all the things linked to social media, et cetera, all that differently. You blend that with knowledge and experience of people who are, who are you know, within a few years of retirement. I think you can have a very exciting um, knowledge base emerging with the back of that. Equally, you've got, you know, the people near retirement who are up to speed on technology in the way others aren't so it's a but but it's that blend that needs to emerge and i don't think we're doing very well with that at this point and that, and the unknown is all the evidence points to the fact that you will have a generation of people coming through who are more keen and more interested in the excitement the innovation etc therefore they're looking for how their careers evolve and move and that means they head towards the point where they might be in a sector for four or five years, but then go off to another job and another job and another job. Uh, I don't think we're going to see the same long term nature of employees in our sector going forward. And that's going to present its own challenges. Um, so I think I think there's work there's work to be done. I know I hate I hate to be negative and I don't want to be negative, but do you think that the universities now have to pay nine, ten thousand pounds a year? You know, they, they could come out of university thirty, forty thousand pounds in debt. Do you think that's a big knock on effect as well? <sighs> oh, that's oh, that's a very difficult one for me to answer. I think I think more so for it, it, 
it could be in terms of so I, I think where you're coming from is well this is this an effect that will mean people want to move jobs on a more regular basis in mm -hmm. order to the point where they, they don't have that debt i i think it i think it's a could well be a factor um the the area that i would argue sits alongside that and and is the engagement between universities and the sector as a whole yeah. some of it's excellent um i would like to see more and and if we can get that blend better we can get that level of support up i think we could then be creating a process where that the next generation that, that comes through the university sector is really interested excited about what's happening in in, in a water sector that that is already starting to use drones, AI, VR, and other clever systems. So, and and actually, when you look at it, it, touches on all types of jobs, from all the classic engineering jobs through to the uh, science jobs, through to social science. I mean, it, it's it's a sector that really does encompass everything that 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 people do. The area that might be more interesting is: does the sector engage with a generation that doesn't go to university? In terms, and that could be apprentices, that could be school leavers, it, it could be those who are interested in in wanting a career that links the environment. Do we shout enough about the fact that we're involved in managing the most precious resource in the world? And actually, as a sector, we're hugely, hugely important in the environment. So, if you want to do something valuable in the environment, knock on the door of the water sector would be my yeah. my statement. Thank you, Paul. I have another question. Um, working with members from the water utility sector, um, what have you found to be the most common challenges that you've come across repeatedly? Uh, hmm. There's several. Um, volume, so I've, I've referenced some that we want to try to challenge in, in, in the presentation. One is obviously silos and how people are working. One is the volume of work that is is expected. Um, with the innovation fund opened this year, and I know that as more and more projects get taken through that mechanism, it's using up the time and resources in terms of people within the utilities. Also, when the regulatory process means that the business planning that the water utilities have to do as part of that regulatory cycle. I mean, every every AMP period, as it's, as it's known, and we're currently in AMP, AMP 7, once, once you get past two and a half years of that AMP period, you're already pulling people into the business planning process to get ready for the next price review. And you lose, you lose access to people within that context as well. So there's 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 lots of those challenges taking place and i think we i think the need to to look at whether the regulation as it is um is still applicable it's been in place since 1989 i think is something that's that's probably overdue in the sector thanks paul um another question um where do you see your place within the transition to complete digital networks and smart cities Oh, I like the smart cities angle. I was on a session yesterday where the organization was talking through what they're doing in the quantum computing world. Um, and uh, once you get away from how quantum mechanics just sort of makes you think differently because you, it, what it talks about can't really happen, but it does happen. I think we as an organization, um, I've tried to reference it earlier, whether where where the hub if you if you're going to move towards a truly digital world um, you have to have an understanding of the information base as it is now and what you want to do to get there and the best will in the world we we, we don't yet know where all the pipe networks are i'll be you know i'm, I'm sure that's no surprise to anyone who, who listens to this or is on the call and and so actually starting to share that information through the hub that, that we help create becomes a huge starting point because you start to talk about what it is you do know now and what does that look like and there's loads of data you know i mentioned something earlier if, if i think of things like leak noise logging there's a lot of data some suppliers will have across various different water companies that contractually 
they're not necessarily the place to be able to to share so if we can break some of those barriers down and help that process of sharing um, some of that knowledge if not all of it you start to shift towards where we see our networks and interactions initially and then you're taking steps forward to start to see where the gaps are and how do you address those gaps and it's that evolving process that leads you towards we know where every network is we know where the connections are and we've actually been digitizing them or at least putting them on a map you know whatever process we've, we've gone through and that has to be our function that's that's where we sit connecting the sector around this issue thank you paul um another question of scalability we are often asked to pose the question about the appropriate level of buy-in and return on investment how do you feel you can help in addressing these two areas for the water industry hmm. so if if i think if i think if i think of it in a in in a couple of ways if i think of it in terms of products you you have manufacturers that and and suppliers um, of, of services do they supplying to one organization doesn't equal scalability necessarily um so one of the things we can do by bringing you know a network like this together and making it function properly is suddenly changing the nature of scalability with an idea or a process or, or technology that might be applicable useful valuable important to all of the sector as a whole uh, not just the utilities, but think of the, con the contractors, the alliance partners, you know, all, all of those, those different elements. That's the first thing. The, the second thing I'd look at is where and how we value what we do. What, how, what do I mean by that? If I look at the regulatory process and the challenges that emerge that around pricing and investment, I start to think, well, where, where I live in the London area, um, I'm paying more for my mobile phone than I am for my water. Um, in other areas, you pay a lot more for your gas and electricity than you do for your water. And, and I think there's a certain level of challenge and disparity there, which needs to be uh, pushed. And this pushed at the regulatory level where we're so focused on returns for investors, we were potentially missing the returns to all of the suppliers that is massively important and therefore you, you change the nature of the investment process if you start to look at that in in a in a different way and, and one example i can link to on this if if i'm trying to run things in the most energy efficient way possible i might actually prefer to have for some of my equipment and, and that could be pumps you know actuators etc that i i might want to lease those under a contract that means the supplier brings in newer, better, more energy efficient versions as part of that lease contract. However, the challenges that procurement are given, and this isn't a criticism of procurement, it's, it's, it's a reality, it means that the procurement teams are often pushed into product buying. So I want, I've got this amount to spend, can I get it for that amount of money per product? So that alignment or realignment with procurement and the outcome delivery incentives performance commitments would be a great step forward if that's something that that we can engender and we've and we as an organization have raised this responding to a government consultation on the challenges of procurement and and how better to to streamline it thank you paul um okay final question paul um what do your members see as the greatest added, sorry, what do your members see as the greatest value added aspect to working with you? What are they telling you? Ooh, <laughs> I should have, um, I should have pulled up a slide or I can reflect exactly, exactly that. So we've, we've been doing a lot of work on, on how we keep pushing ourselves forward. They, they like the organization is seen as a very engaging organization therefore it's very personable um, and especially so interestingly during the last 15 to 18 months where we think that you know we've all got used to this but you start to question how personable it is we've had that feedback we've had the feedback that we very much represent their view and their voice 
they like that we're prepared to engage with and challenge um, the regulators and that we engage with the utilities and bring them into the discussion in ways that didn't happen in the past. And they like the fact that because we have the word future in our name, we constantly want to see things that are different for the mm -hmm. sector and, and, and better and keep pushing that agenda going forward. So that we, we are focused on having a connected sector and a workforce that completely understands innovation, is fully engaged, et cetera. And, and they recognize that we are pushing that door to support them, not just through water dragons, but through engagement at the utility level. Um, in fact, a good example, Martin, is this afternoon, we, we've got a session with one of the utilities talking about a combination of their green recovery plans, things we can work with them on as an organization, uh, not just in this current AMP, but uh, you know, AMP and, and, and beyond. Um, and it's a very open engagement session where I think 30, 35 of our members are involved along with ourselves. and. And the utilities open that door because they get huge value from us and we're bringing everyone together to talk around a whole number of issues so oh. yeah Sorry. yeah no so it's, okay. it's it's that it's that focus all the time and constantly going back to members and then looking forward so we're pushing the agenda as much as we can as an organization well, many, many thanks for your presentation on the Q&A. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I would like again to say a big thank you to Paul from the Future Water Association for an excellent presentation and Q&A session. Paul, we really appreciate your time. Thank you very much, sir. Pleasure and happy to hear from anyone in relation to anything that I said. Thanks. Sir. Thank you very much. Um, today's webinar, just to let you know, will be on demand for you to rewatch as well. Um, thank you to everybody for attending. And once again, a big thank you to Paul from the Future Water Association. And we look forward to seeing you at our next We Water webinar. Have a good week, Paul. Enjoy the football at the weekend. Good luck. All the best. Goodbye. Thank you.